Uh, first is Jerry Norman. Most of you here. Uh, Jerry is a senior plan reviewer at uh, Lincoln College of Standard Division for the state of Minnesota. Uh, he's been there 12 years, Jerry? 12 years as a lead plan reviewer uh, on any project that the state has jurisdiction on, including schools, hospitals, nursing homes, correctional facilities, and state owned facilities. Uh, meets with architects, engineers, owners, contractors on a variety of projects, usually during the preliminary basis of a plan review and that sort of thing. Uh, and he's also a co-chair of the committee that's responsible for uh, coming up with reviewing and recommending amendments to the state building code. So, Jerry, thank you for being here. Uh, Gordy Bates is next. Uh, I know a lot of people already here know, know Gory. Uh, over 35 years of experience in, in fire protection and fire prevention. Uh, he's worked for Gordy's worked for fire protection contractors for a facility owner named 3M. Uh, A&E firms named namely Ellerby, and then obviously now in the Code Enforcement Authority uh, with the Minneapolis Fire Department, where he has been there for 20 years. Uh, Gordon is presently the Assistant Fire Marshal over there. He's past president of FMAM, Fire Marshals Association of Minnesota. Uh, he's been involved in training for fire and building inspectors, and currently an alternate representative uh, representing the International Fire Marshals Association on an NFP 13 committee. It's uh, discharge. Discharge criteria. So that's Gordy. Gordy, thank you for being here. Uh, Wilt Berger. Wilt is the president uh, of Miller Hansen. Also very old. <laughs> 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 I really uh, uh, Wilt is president of, of Miller Hansen. Uh, Miller Hansen is a, an architectural firm that specializes in residential design. Uh, roughly 25 people. Uh, prior to, to being at Miller Hansen, um, Wilt had got his architecture degree from the University of Minnesota. Uh, spent to a total of eight years as a designer for the state of Minnesota and as a code official for the city of Columbia. Were you the building official? I was an assistant. Okay. okay. Uh, Wilt is currently the chairman of the Governor's Council on, Scott, uh, on Fire Prevention and Control, so he works with Scott Control with that group. Uh, also a member of NFPA. Uh, past member and chair of the Building Code Committee over at a AIA, the American Institute of Architects, and also a past member of the Legislative Committee. So, well, thank you for being here. Jim Falkenbridge at the end. Uh, Jim is principal at KFI, Marcus mm -hmm. Falkenbridge Incorporated, uh, an engineering and commissioning firm in Roseville, roughly 60 people who are at right now. Side, pretty close. Pretty close. Uh, he's a graduate of NDSU with a mechanical engineering degree. Uh, experience in the design of mechanical piping systems for buildings and high hazard industrial plants. Uh, Jim has assisted uh, confidential clients on a lot of uh, high risk assessment for high profile sites, uh, catastrophic, catastrophic events, including a real time measurement of smoke and chemical agents through the building HVAC system. And as a smoke control person, I would be very interested in discussing that with you. Uh, Jim's a member of ASME, American Society of Mechanical Engineers, and also ASHRAE. Thank you for being here. Okay, um, yours truly is going to be the moderator, and yours truly has never been a moderator, so if I'm doing anything for wrong, let me know. Uh, as far as format, what, what we want to do is um, we've got a list of, of pre selected questions. Uh, the idea is I will say the question, and then each will alternate who's going to start to answer first. You can give your screen, whether it be 10 seconds or however long you want it to be. Uh, what, Hold your questions until each person is done. So you don't you don't have to wait until all four people have gone through, but just we don't want any questions until they've at least had their chance to, to say their opening statement. Okay? So Jerry, you're uh, you pick the right <laughs> yeah. Okay, this is a good question for you. Uh, do you feel that the potential benefits and potential problems of fire protection for the long-term life of the building are well understood by Mr. or Ms. Owner? In my opinion, no. I just, you know, I look at, and I know a lot of the industry, as far as code is related, is, is trying to grow toward performance-based codes. But performance-based codes, at least in my opinion, brings on a lot of inherent problems. And a lot of them, to me, are directed toward the owner. 
because the owner takes on a much greater responsibility relative to the protection of the building over, over the building's lifetime. And I personally, just in the buildings that I deal with, which is schools, institutional activities, and that, it still comes down to the bottom line. How much is it going to cost me? And the owner a lot of times doesn't see the real world benefits of spending money on items that aren't pretty, like fire protection. And, or passive fire protection within a building. I mean, it, this goes all the way from residential construction, trying to convince an owner to spend a little bit more money on a foundation wall so they don't have problems 20 years down the line. The problem is they associate costs with things that they want to be, see, be able to see where this cost actually benefits them. I think the building code has come along now with the IBC, and at least the architects and engineers can stand there and say, if we don't sprinkle, this is what we have to do. If we sprinkle, this is what goes away. And at least from that standpoint, but again, that comes down to cost. Okay, I can save money if I sprinkle. But as far as them coming in and understanding that fire protection, you know, is a way that I can benefit the occupants of the building, I can benefit myself in that. I just think it's an uphill climb a lot of times with the owner. Because the owner's bottom line is, what is it going to cost me? What benefit do I get? So, so it sounds like it's almost, uh, at best, it's necessary evil. Kind of, uh, so any and I always just say, well, the fire marshal's mandate. <laughs> <laughs> well, I agree with Jerry, uh, but also along with that, e even once the uh, you know, architect or developer or owner have made their decisions, what systems go into a building, most owners apparently are not aware of the ongoing maintenance and testing of the credit systems. Because that's one of the things that we run across a lot is uh, we will check for the annual tests of the fire pump as an example. And many owners will say, well, it's sort of out of sight, out of mind. It's not something that they use every day. And so they tend to forget that you know, there's fire suppression or fire protection systems do need to be inspected, do need to be tested. So that's one of the problems I see. And again, as, as, as the panelists make their, their, their point, feel free to uh, speak up with questions or, or comments or whatever. My, my firm is, is uh, involved basically with residential construction. Uh, Multi-family, high-rises, uh, a lot of care facilities, uh, senior facilities, that sort of thing. Right now we're doing a lot of condominiums. So the market niche that I'm really involved with and it is, is fairly narrow in terms of uh, fire and life safety, but there are an awful lot of people building buildings and uh, owners building houses that don't have any idea of what uh, life safety and, and uh, uh, systems like this are, are all about. I mean, we had a conversation earlier about people that are going out and building these half million dollar and million dollar houses on lakes where there isn't a fire department within you know a long distance we have no uh, uh, sense of what they need to protect themselves the building in the woods so you know a firestorm could come up and just wipe their house out right away and then when they get all done they go to the insurance company and they say you know how much of my insurance rates going to be and, and you know then they go through the roof one of our goals in terms of the uh, Governor's Council on uh, Fire Prevention and Control is to look at the uh, possibility of having a more statewide enforcement of uh, the building code. So it levels the field for uh, the different contractors and provides the same, same sort of minimal, <coughs> minimal level of safety for all the residents. It was for yeah, you and your firm had any effect on that? Did you try to sell sprinklers to build these big houses? Did you have any successes with that? Because well, you know, most of the work that, that we do is, is large enough so that it really comes under the, the, the sprinkler system. We don't do a lot of single family homes. Uh, and, uh, you know, when we have, you know, we have to try to encourage people to put sprinkler systems in. Ever succeeded in that? And able to pop them into it? Oh, yeah. yeah. What, what do you suppose was convinced of? 
what it is for the moment. Well, the possibility of saving some money on insurance, I think, really is the most practical way to approach that. And, uh, you know, they can see some long-term benefit besides the fact that, you know, it's going to be a safe, safe environment. Thank you. Steve, did you Okay. And just to reiterate, just so everyone knows the perspective here, that the point that why we chose these people is we've got a building code person, a fire code person, an architect, and an engineer. So that's kind of the, the thought process. Kind of so it's the beginning of a good joke. <laughs> 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 yeah, the engineer didn't die. That's great. <laughs> good. Well, one of the benefits of doing last question is that uh, you can run along the way. I, I, touched on a lot of them, I think I want to emphasize a couple of things. To directly answer your question, uh, do the owners understand? I think it's fair. <coughs> we need to be fair to the owners. Some of them really do. And uh, they spend a lot of time doing some of the clients that we have and the departments associated with it. And it seems that there, there's a parallel between the level of risk that these people who I spend a fair amount of time on the industrial side, they have the potential for catastrophic loss that will either take their business out of play or take their uh, inventory out of play or what have you, they tend to pay more attention. And uh, to, the, uh, to the point that Will had mentioned, that was going to dive into the insurance bit, I really think that to get their attention, the only way to get their ROI attention is from an enforcement standpoint, from a code standpoint, all you can do is tell them where the line can't be crossed. But from a risk assessment strategy, we've seen a lot of input uh, placed by the uh, risk assessors uh, in terms of the... You know, it's easy to convince somebody that has had a catastrophic explosion in their plant that they can create an environment. But uh, I really see that a lot of pressure is going to be applied if we're looking to change things from the risk assessment standpoint for the insurance companies a lot. I, mean, I think that would be the best place to go. So, that's all I want to add to that. I know usually our group is pretty insurance intended. Are there any insurance folks that want to chime in or not? A couple working in here. From anybody, I guess, from insurance. Okay. So I had uh, a few people, you know, sitting in front of building inspectors or fire marshals, uh, you know, with our clients and, and you know, people trying to tell uh, this client that we've got to save a lot of money building this apartment building, you know, if you've got a sprinkler system. And, and uh, you know, I think that facts are just not so, you know, particularly if you build a type of one building, uh, the insurance rates are so low in a you know, high-rise structure without a sprinkler system that the owner isn't going to save any money. The occupants of the building, you know, are the ones that cover most of the uh, uh, stuff that's in the building. So uh, from that standpoint, I don't think that's a very good uh, tool to start a sprinkler system. Of course, those buildings are all covered by, uh, by the state requirements. One, I would agree. With you. But, you know, some of the firms that we deal with, you're right. I mean, they're driven by, if you're talking downtime, again, we're talking money. And so they're weighing the cost of we can't afford the downtime. Anderson Windows is a perfect example. You know, they have a fire suppression system within the manufacturing division to deal with essentially sparks within their dust containment system. They don't want downtime. They're going to make sure that there is no downtime by their fire suppression system. And so they're, they're constantly weighing. And that's uh, John Nisham, you know John. John has a, a good way of promoting fire suppression within schools. And he uses a couple examples here in the metro area. A few years ago, we had a couple fires in some metro schools. One of the schools had a fire suppression system. The other did not. The one that had the fire suppression by and large, the damage was limited to the room of origin. There was some smoke damage, but as far as major damage, it was the room of origin. The other building, the fire burned, and then was stopped by an area separation wall, firewall, if you want to call it, under the IBC. While the one building was put back in operation within a couple weeks, the other school, the kids were displaced for a whole semester, and they had to be totally disrupted, the busing, the parents, everyone. <coughs> And John, although when he first said it, I was kind of alarmed by it. his comment during one of the meetings that he was invited to with us, his comment to the architect was, have you asked the school district 
What do they have as a contingency plan if this building catches on fire? Where will the kids go? If you're choosing not to put a fire suppression system in this building, what if the unthinkable happens? What are you going to do? How do you tell your people in your town that your kids are going to be immobiles and portables or spread between three different buildings? And that's a good approach because from a building code standpoint, we're a minimum code. The fire code isn't necessarily that, but we're a minimum code. We're not going to punish you if you want to go beyond that, but we are intended to be the minimum code out there. So that's the, the threshold that we establish. We'd love to see, you know, every building with concrete and a fire suppression system, but from a code standpoint, no. We look at what is the minimum. And as the code from a national level or with 1306 at the local level of the state of Minnesota, as those thresholds change, fine, we'll enforce those. But, you know, that's what we look toward relative to the enforcement of the code. I think that's... Uh to me, that's what's helpful about something like this is the story of you know, the schools. Because from my perspective, the people that I'm working with or working for, they they will uh, they listen to what you're saying. You know, so if, if you've got a tangible example of something like that, they'll they'll take that more. So I think that gets back to Steve, what you were asking. You know, what what's something that we can tell them? Just little bits and pieces. Any other comments on this? Okay, uh, Gordy, you're, you're first on this one. Uh, c considering the, the, the building as kind of a collection of systems, by systems I mean you know, sprinklers, fire alarm, maybe smoke control, uh, fire rate construction, uh, what's your opinion over the next, say, 10 years as codes evolve? What, which of these systems, you know, it seems that we recently sprinklers have been more, required more and more and fire rate construction going down more and more, just as an example. Do you see that continuing and of these systems, which, one, you know, which, which direction do you think these systems are? Yeah, I don't know if we've hit a threshold yet where that uh, threat will continue, where it will get more and more trade-offs. And you're talking putting about in, sprinklers. Right. For putting in sprinklers, not have to invest money in hard construction. You know, there's some people feel that we've already gone beyond a reasonable, reasonable point with the latest building code where uh, fire-rated uh, corridors are not required in sprinkler buildings and things like that. So, not having a crystal ball, uh, I don't know what would happen if, you know, if anything, I would expect to see that sprinklers would be required uh, more in buildings that may not require sprinklers at this present time. In other words, smaller buildings, uh, different types of occupancies, and we've seen that trend over the last you know, 30, 40 years. Um, <coughs> Now, there has been a trend away from smoke control in high-rise buildings. The adoption of smoke, there was uh, a state amendment to deal with post fire exhaust. Uh, that, I guess that surprised me. I didn't expect to see that happen. Uh, so as far as buildings are concerned, uh, based on the track record of compartmentation, you know, hard construction, that historically hasn't worked too well. So if anything, Maybe, maybe there will be less compartmentation, possibly more smoke. Wild guess. Wild guess. <clears throat> I, doing high-rise residential construction you know, is something that's really highly compartmentalized. And uh, you know, even before the requirements of the sprinkling uh, high-rise buildings, I think the last one we did was the Lake Point condominium towers on Lake Calhoun, which wasn't sprinkling. Uh, but we've had a number of fires in some of our high-rise buildings that were not sprinkled and uh, have never had, you know, real significant loss of property or life. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I, in my way of thinking, I can't imagine that the sprinkler requirements are going to be expanded significantly in residential construction. You know, I think there's an opportunity for municipalities to provide some incentive for for putting sprinkler systems into smaller buildings. And I think that's, you know, there's some potential for life safety, a potential for saving dollars in terms of municipal uh, expenses. You're putting the cost then on the people that really need it uh, rather than becoming a tax sort of situation. But, you know, my concern is much more uh, in this residential uh, field about smoke distribution in buildings and, and uh, because that's, the most deadly part of it has killed most of the people. 
and the uh, fires that we have. Okay. Question. Yeah, I'm just
continue a trend to, to essentially require bonds more often. Fire suppression, absolutely. I think the trend is to either mandate it or encourage its installation within buildings. And if none of you have picked up the 2003 IBC, at least if you're, look, if you're looking in the IBC, guess what? For our occupancies, they're all required to be sprinkled. If they're an IBC building, there is no 16 dwelling units, multiple stories. If you're in our occupancy under the IBC, you are required to be sprinkled. Now, a lot of people are like, oh, crap, I've got to sprinkle my house. No. Houses and certain other occupancies will be directed to the IRC. The IRC doesn't have a mandate for sprinkling. There is, however, a discussion between our division, building codes of standards and the state fire marshal's division, over what we may perceive as a technicality that the the state fire or the IFC doesn't necessarily send you to the IRC. When they classify a building, they classify a building. It doesn't have the default to the IRC. We don't personally feel that was the intent, but that is definitely the way the IFC is worded. And theoretically, if that were true, every R would have to be sprinkled. Single family houses, duplexes, it doesn't matter what size. Because of that, and Steve, you might be more aware of this than I am, the 1306 committee, with the support of GOMA, is actually looking at reducing the threshold for fire suppression for R3 occupancies, be it townhomes or other R's, from the current 8,500 down to 5,000. That's not you know, definite yet, but it's something that's being discussed. So I think fire suppression, there'll be more and more incentives. I think with some of the nightclub fires and that, the, the threshold for A occupancy is at 300 occupants or 5,000 5, fire area or 12,000, depending on which A you are in A2 or A3. I anticipate that's going to change. The standards say it's okay for 300 people to be in a non sprinkler building in assembly occupancy that we have a history of problems with. I anticipate that's going to change and that threshold is going to continue to drop. Come on. Well, I was just wanted to add something to smoke control. I think what we may have found is that if your fires are small, <coughs> all fairly early with sprinklers, that you really don't need smoke control. And I think maybe that's what the coal is is identifying, say, you know what, we're putting a lot of money into smoke control when there really isn't a need for it in a proper list. Okay, question I had, uh, not necessarily any particular individual who ever wants to try and field it. Uh, you talk about development of codes. How, how do you feel the development of codes in the next 10 years are going to be affected by Groups, organizations, lobbies, etc., for different factions such as the sprinkler industry, the fire alarm industry, gypsum board industry, concrete industry. Uh, how do all these uh, organizations and some of them have self interests? Um, how are they going to, do you think, shape our codes in the future? I think that you know, the codes have traditionally been shaped by tragedies. And, you know, I, I don't know how much impact these industries have, you know, the development of those codes. Uh, but as soon as somebody, you know, a bunch of people die in a high-rise fire or something, you know, all of a sudden everything kind of changes. It's the uh, fire spread uh, requirements that came out of the COVID-19 profile, you know, I'm really old, so I know a lot of this stuff. <laughs> and, you know, some of the high-rise fires that took place in South America where they have a if one stairway of the buildings were full of uh, propane gas, you know, all of a sudden everybody wanted to change everything that went into a high-rise building, where they're not comparing apples to apples at all. Uh, but, you know, that's how the major code changes have happened in the last, you know, forever. Codes are reaction. Very much. Well, I think codes probably were more influenced by individual industries in the past than they are now, mainly because the building officials and fire officials, I think, are better educated now. And they're able to recognize you know, 
what is a legitimate fire safety system and what is a So I think I think there's less influence. No, 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 no. You want to jump on the soapbox again? <laughs> no, I guess, you know, when you mentioned um, the Concrete Institute, I, if, if any of you have ever been, I'm sure it's, I've never been to the NFPA one, if you've ever been to an annual business meeting, uh, the ABMs of ICBO, I, I refer to them as the annual bowel movement because of what comes out of it sometimes. But <laughs> um, it, it's always amusing to me because at the national level, you have a bunch of hired guns essentially representing industries. And they propose code changes, and they're heard at the national level. And the one that always I just have to giggle at every time they get up there is the Masonry Institute. Now, I, I think Masonry is great, but it's humorous because they insert code changes that will say firewall should be Masonry. Fire barrier should be Masonry. This wall should be Masonry. And it's just, you know, and you're right. I mean, they get defeated, every, and I'm just like, my gosh, but they keep trying every year. And they come up with statistics, the whole stream, and how much better the wall it is, and everything. And this, this does go back to, of course, I would prefer a masonry wall. Obviously, we have state amendments that talk about what uh, the will accept the masonry firewall relative to dividing buildings and our occupancies where we won't accept the gypsum wall. I, Totally understand, assuming no one's punched a hole in it, a masonry wall is better. But again, the IBC is a minimum code. You can't stand there and say, you need a concrete wall. And I know a lot of people have speculated because of the Twin Towers that they may, the codes may evolve to require hardened construction of the stair enclosures because of what happened there. That what, one stair enclosure was totally taken out of commission because it was essentially a gypsum enclosure. And there was some discussion over that that may be you know, the next home thing is that we're going to mandate this. I don't think it'll happen. I mean, I personally just don't think it's going to happen. I think, I don't think we fortunately, can. now that we've waited a few years, I think a lot of emotion has been removed, and people can realize we cannot design for that type of incident or disaster. And we shouldn't expect owners of buildings to design for that. So. I think I've had an opportunity to get to know for business review folks on it. The FPA 3661 committees. Those are committees that handle specifically class one, four to 36, and then another committee is class 61. And it's true uh, what you say that those codes all got uh, some real catastrophes. And then you saw an overreaction as we argued about the number of distances and the number of hires that you can place on the site and so forth. But, and there were a lot of people with a lot of manufacturing settings who had seats on that committee, but it seems like the more educated the committee got, then mercifully through the uh, debate and discussion that happened, we're starting to bring some sense into those things now. We're not just building walls that fumes can go around and it made no sense with some other guy. And I really think it is because people who don't have a vested interest in materials or equipment or one particular method of control uh, are educated enough to make it past the smell. But I'm optimistic about it. That's it. It's no fun to see how laws and average are made. But, uh, you know, it's a really way to get full edit data and so on. So I would encourage you to stay with me. That's it. Uh, going another way, somewhat uh, with the fire alarms, but the lot now with panels, especially like the fire pump panels and alarm panels, you see so much more computerized and digitized areas like that. Um, I know probably more with engineering and architect too. How much do you see this coming out in front? They talk about these smart houses where everything's all computer controlled for, for lighting and air conditioning and everything else. Where do you see those trends going if they're going to continue to evolve and uh, even so much as you know controlling all the statics and detectors and stuff from room to room and stuff if, if there's more of that coming up you talk about controlling static measuring things like static dissipation well like you're seeing where computers are involved <coughs> well i think we're just going to say where we're going to go I can't think offhand of any catastrophe that was maybe you probably can't at least come out of a, a data center other than the, the loss of data, but that's because of business loss more so than the life of other property loss. And, uh, I, 
I think that the, uh, the debate will rage until it, uh, there's a certain amount of momentum that it loses if there are not incidents to fuel it. And I, where it goes, I don't know. There's so much group to put on these N-plus-1 redundancy facilities and guard critical data that uh, I think they're taking care of around the uh, code issues and dealt with the business reasons. And the piggyback on that, the only, the only thing, um, a frustration I find at the national code level is when you have new technologies come about, it tends to not be readily accepted at the national level within the codes. You know, you tend to wait for 8, 12 years before you actually have some of these technologies introduce themselves into the building. And I'm all for it making sure that they're proper and that, you know, they're going to work and do what they need to do. But at times, from my standpoint, it's, it's somewhat frustrating because you have items that, to me, actually would accomplish code provisions in a better way. From a mechanical standpoint, you know, the ASHRAE committee and that, essentially, rather than just dumping a dollar of fresh air, actually having monitors to monitor the contaminants in the room and introducing fresh air as needed. I mean, that's a perfect example. My gosh, that makes a lot more sense than just prescriptively saying we need this much CFM of outside air. You know, so it, even those type of items, they take a while. It, it comes down to building officials may choose to accept them in the meantime, but that's always a problem for designers, be it architects or engineers. You have to sell it to the building official. And of course, they're going to say, well, where's its testing? Where's its listing? Who's accepting it? What code accepts it? And it's, it's an uphill climb. And, here in Minnesota, Will and I were talking about dementia units and how we as a state have an amendment. We had a policy, now we have an amendment to deal with dementia units and allow for locking. At the national level, they still do not address locking relative to dementia units. If your mother or father needs to be in a place where they need to be secured under the IBC, you either have to use delayed egress, which is not a good way of doing it, or you have to design the building as a prison. Grandma's in jail. That's how you deal with dementia from the national code level. We at the state level have essentially chosen to deal with it at this point rather than waiting. So. Can you talk about technology? This is maybe more for Gordon. I would think a lot of people here would want to know, are you approached, like take sprinklers as an example, are you approached very often with the sprinkler head that's, there's an approval question, like, you know, it's, it's a new technology, maybe all the listings aren't done yet, and people are trying to, that sort of thing go on? Not very often, no. It's always, they've got the cut sheet. Right, okay. Yeah, somebody else has done the, the testing, the, the listing. We can, all we need to do is make sure it's installed right. Or you talked about computers uh, operating systems. Uh, I may have answered the question a little differently this morning when I turned on the computer, but at about noon, after I sat there for a half hour because the thing froze up, I had to make a call to it. It's Portland, Oregon. It controls all this stuff. For whatever reason, uh, it decided not to print something, and my computer was useless until somebody half country away, I don't know what they did, or was, or a couple of keystrokes, something like that. That's, you know, that's one of the problems I've got with computers. I hope to God it is that Microsoft is coming up with programs. <laughs> the, other, the other thing is with fire alarm systems, you've got the programmable fire alarm systems where you can program the system to sound alarms on, let's say, three floors or one floor of the entire building, or, you know, play taps, whatever you want to do. What happens a year from now when an alarm tech goes in, they add another device, and he changes something in that system? And we've had that happen in between uh, some initial testing and final testing on the fire alarm systems where they didn't, you know, the final testing indicated that system did not work the same as it did a week previous because a tech had been in doing something else on that system, and now, inadvertently followed up uh, some part of it where, where it reports to it. You know, I don't, I've, I've got, I still have concerns about relying on computer programs that somebody has access to a change. Okay, for you guys that are fine, just, we just switched to a 
uh, and now I'm just kind of smush three and four together. Um, Jim, do you want water? Do you guys want water? Um, I think they work better when they're unedged. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Here's, uh, Here's uh, a good example or an opportunity to, to get out of soapbox. Um, and Will, you happen to be first. Uh, what is the fire protection industry currently doing to make your job easier? And what can the fire protection industry do differently to help make your job easier? Maybe this is from an architect. <laughs> the, the headaches that I have come from the uh, regulatory uh, end of things. You know, we don't have a problem designing a building if we know what the rules and regulations are. And you know, most of the time, the clients you know, are ready to, to pay the price. Uh, but when the rules change from community to community, and, and, uh, that's just such a headache. It has to be a headache for you too, uh, going from community to community and having a different uh, set of standards applied. Uh, try to go back to the owner and, and get uh, you know, a lot of dollars to uh, change the system. I think you're the Bell Bell that you should have known this all along. But, uh, I think that uh, in our office we have. Uh, People come in and, and give us seminars on the latest thinking on, on alarm systems and, and sprinkler systems and, and uh, try to keep the people that are, are designing the buildings and you know, uh, putting the construction documents together informed as to what, you know, what's proper and what's uh, the rules that we ought to be following. So uh, you know, I think we're getting the help that we need in terms of designing. Uh, good question. I, I think in general things are going very well because it is a tricky industry. It's under a fair amount of change in terms of who gets to stamp drawings, who should stamp drawings. How do you get? Uh, how do you get? How do you treat a condition which we have to the alarms? Those are tough subjects. I, I think the uh, thing that that we find is uh, of the most value is we get into tricky situations that are that are difficult. Situation where we get a, you know, a kill in the presence of Mr. Third was, was insisted upon by the local official because on the planner he was that way. But the temperature of the kill was such that if that thing went off just because of the heat around the kill uh, and the vaporization of the water turning into steam, the cure was going to be substantially worse than the disease. And um, we needed the support. And in fact, it was successful. So uh, that's an example of, I, I think, to folks that are in the business full time, it's a lot of different situations. My job is a mechanical engineer. Uh, I like to lay claim to the interstitial space above the ceiling. A lot of stuff has got to go up there. And uh, all those things are uh, water protection pipe. So uh, that resource is a big plus. I think uh, what could the industry do differently? I don't know how you get around certain things. I think the communication, we've learned it because we needed to, but I think uh, communication in terms of some of the labor uh, issues associated with getting in and trying to, because the sprinkler fair unions, for example, have some different rules than some of the other unions. It's important to get that message out from a business owner standpoint, uh, because uh, as an engineer, we don't associate very well with the unions, uh, rather with the contractors that they serve. And there are issues associated with that, but I think you could know about it in the design construction scale. On the fire alarm side, uh, well, that's a rapidly changing in the industry. Issues of compatibility, I think, can be addressed uh, between systems. We went through this on the HVAC uh, building automation systems themselves. We're trying to tie everything together, and everybody claims uh, uh, we, we have the answer, and everyone can talk to us in our system, but as a general, it takes two to handshake. So I think there, are, there is work left to be done. Um, 
I guess if we're, if we're including installers relative to fire protection industry, the number one complaint that we get for fire suppression from Jim Fallon, who's our fire suppression reviewer, is it would be really nice to get the drawings before it's installed. I mean, <laughs> you know, we realize that, I mean, gosh, you know, it's, it just doesn't happen sometimes, but I know from his frustration, if he writes up a review comment relative to the design, and they said, well, that's already installed. I mean, realistically, I think. And I don't know, I can't speak for Minneapolis or other cities, but I hear this is, I don't want to say common within the industry. And maybe a lot of it has existed because building officials, I won't say fire marshals, but have allowed that to happen. You know, the infamous, they're not typically submitted, they're shop drawings. I mean, so it's like a set of shop drawings relative to precast or anything else within the building. You have architectural drawings, you have engineering drawings, they give you a layout, but, you know, a lot of times they don't give you anything else. You rely on the fire suppression installer to put the shop drawings, and so often in our department, we get them after the fact. And it causes a problem because, I mean, the reality is, is if it's already installed, that's not our fault. And just, you know, we just wish we could get the drawings ahead of time and get them approved. I know the specs may cover and everything else, but we're still seeing that is going on within the industry. Rather than bring up a good point about the shop drawings, is, is it feasible from a permitting point of view to have that, I mean, to, to put that to the owner and say, you, we won't give you a permit? Because right now it's set up where you, you can do exactly that. You can get a building permit and not have shop drawings. Mm -hmm. From a regulations point of view, is it possible to kind of change the law, so to speak, and have that be a requirement? Because then the owners are going to start listening. Well, you know, and, and again, I use uh, special inspection as an example. At least at the state of Minnesota, we act as a municipality for a lot of projects. And we used to um, say, well, you need to, you know, the engineer would call out which, which areas needed special inspection. But they'd never tell us who was going to do it, who the firm was, who the individual was. And even though the building code is very specific on what needs to be submitted to the municipality for approval on special inspection, we always, as a municipality, again, always speaking to the state of Minnesota, we always tended to trust the designers, the architects, the engineers, and the owners that that documentation would be submitted to us after the permit was issued. And it finally got to a point where we were having buildings built that had no special inspection, even though they were supposed to. Um, we had some firms that were listed on their special inspection schedule and had never been entered into a contract with. They were just listed because they knew they'd be bought. So we finally made the determination that we as the state of Minnesota will not issue a building permit until the special inspection schedule is totally complete. Everybody's signature is present, the owner, the contractor, the engineer. Every special inspector is called upon, the individual signatures, everything. And we more or less were forced to do that. Now we have not chosen to do that with the fire suppression. And we prefer not to. We don't want to necessarily be a hindrance. But yeah, I don't know at what point that would be mandated. Of course, you know, that everybody's punished, you know, for some people. And I mean, I know some of you may work with cities. I'll mention Plymouth, because usually that makes people, you know, know where we're at. But you know, there are some cities that would not allow you to issue addendums to them. They want the addendums incorporated into the documents. Don't even bother sending packets of addendums. I got to tell you, it's irritating me when I get a set of documents and I think I'm done with the review. Slack. Here comes 80 pages of addendums. And then, of course, the architect calls me and says, well, how are you doing in my review? And, you know, I'd say, well, I'd be doing a lot better if you hadn't sent this damn addendum. Then I go up on the hill for sensitivity training and, you know, <laughs> 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 I mean, we haven't gotten to that point where we're mandating this middle of drawings and call addendums, but we have done something to encourage you not to do it, which is we have what's referred to as a per preferred plan review submittal which means we're going to move you to the front of the line if you have no addendum, and if you've had a preliminary meeting with us. But for all you that don't want to, you know, want to submit these addendums, well, guess what? Don't expect your plan to be very quick, because we, we are just not going to worry about it if you've chosen to do it that way. You know, and that brings into the design building all that, too. That's a problem. So, anyway.
dividends are not always a matter of choice. <laughs> Set a project out for the bids, if it comes in half a million dollars over, something has to happen. There's going to be some paperwork that results in that. So, uh, it's not and I understand that. I mean, all I'm saying is I've noticed a trend in recent years that dividends used to be about this thick, and now it's like the old Sears catalog. So I'm dating myself. You know, it's this thick. We've, We've got much stuff. better writing. <laughs> <laughs>
there's any people that say that's good or bad, tell me now. But that, that, was, that was the intent. So we probably won't get through all of this. Um, why don't we do the licensing one? If there's any specific, I, I don't know how much you guys have pre studied this, but if there's any specific things you definitely want to address, we'll do that after the license today. So keep that in the back burner. There's been talk over recent years about the decision for fire protection drawings to be required to be signed by a licensed engineer, including sprinklers and possible water. Do you think that requirement will ever materialize in the state of Minnesota? And if so, do you think it would be a good thing or not? As a licensed engineer, you yeah. can go first. Well, they're, they're fair questions, and uh, I'm one who believes strongly in, in the licensure. And I, um, zooming out from fire protection to the, the issue of licensure in general, uh, you see that battle just in terms of having a registered, in my case, mechanical engineer with drawings to stamp electrically, what can a master electrician do versus what does the penalty have to stamp? I think we're facing the same issue here. That question has two parts. Should it be a registered mechanical engineer for sprinkler? Should it be a registered fire protection engineer for, for sprinkler? I, I believe that this is a complex enough issue. We are talking about life safety here. That is, we require uh, plumbing drawings which have a health and safety effect. We should require also fire protection. How that is done, I think, is a matter for some debate. And there will, all, and there will be some, someone left out in the cold. If it's, if it's a, a uh, licensed fire protection engineer, or if you're nice and certified, you see about 80% of the buildings that come through, I have no problem. Well, we, and the reason why I brought up the, the subject of licensure in general is because it's one of the very things we run into at uh, professional engineer level. We have colleagues, for example, that work for Port Motor Company. Why do I need to be registered? I never have, I never will. I know what I need to know. And, uh, and it's kind of sad because you know, you need a license to practice real estate, you need a license to practice law. And I think that uh, we can address the individual talents of people with nice and with PEs. And there was an issue, I think, that was brought up during dinner, so you can't just flop over PEs. There's not enough of them out there to fulfill the demand. Well, that's what that's what periods of time and years and grandfather clauses do for us to address them. So uh, I am in favor of it. I, in, in a perfect world, I would like to see it rolled under the, the either mechanical or electrical fields, just simply because we got enough, particularly from an architecture standpoint, we got enough guys turning us to the plan to way through. But not, as an industry, we're not ready for it. And uh, some suggestions might be. Licensed fire protection engineer can stand for anything. If you're going to be a PE, there has to be a rider along the proof that you have competency in the fire protection area. So we we'll write a set of protocol for that so we don't believe fire protection. What credit is going to be given for those with the various NICIP level certifications? The higher the level of NICIP, the easier the requirements to get your fire protection engineer license. Well, let's tackle it. Uh, you know, I'm not sure that I have a, I'm not, you know, I'm kind of out of this discussion. I mean, I know it's been a discussion that's been going on for years. It's went on relative to a master electrician, a master plumber preparing drawings. Um, and, you know, I have a lot a greater sense of confidence in a set of documents that is, has been certified by a, a licensed professional. Uh, but to me, this is an issue that, at least for me as a state of Minnesota, we're dictated by the legislature and by statutes and that. So, I mean, I'm going to leave it up to them. i got enough of my play days and years, and I'll let them decide and certify what. I go to the Board of Architecture, Engineering, and Land Survey. I check exempt, non-exempt, what they say, and that's what I go by. I guess I'm pretty much neutral on the subject. Uh, if I thought that requiring the PEs to stamp the drawings would raise the, the level of competency enough, then I'd be for it. I'm not sure that would happen. I uh, don't have any strong feelings one way or the other. Uh, 
is that the person has to be a direct full time payroll person. Uh, but they can't just sort of have seen the draw of the and take them off of an angel. Well, that's, that's a great experience. Well, I spent the last four years in Florida doing work, and uh, the authority had a jurisdiction in Florida that was governed by the counties, not by the local municipalities for the most part. Orlando might be an exception, Miami, but I'll tell you it's it's uh, the licensing issue and requirement for stamp drawings down there is uh, it's it's a joke. I mean, they hire these guys out to speed and they'll travel around the contract with the contractor, they'll stamp the drawings. And honestly, I've seen them where they do, they'll sit and talk about the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, whether or not I'm looking at the drawings and stamping the drawings and picking up a check and going to my competitor to do the same thing. And my wish uh, would be to recognize the level of my set as competency, because uh, whether it's three or four, I don't know, it's like something as, uh, as, you know, as the governing approval stamp or what have you. The first right is the situation with the nice for higher situations with the I don't think so. I mean, I'm just speaking of, I would, I would think the fellow contractors in here, we, I want my designers to be level four. They're going to give me a better product and take less risk away from me as far as the company. And, uh, you know, we run into trouble where we've had four designers and it's cost us money. I can't afford that. I would, uh, well, I, I don't, I don't, those here to set the level of confidence that would define what an acceptable level of confidence for a fire protection engineer is. Maybe it is, though. My issue I think, is set them up and stick with them. And uh, you know, the story about plant stamping is as old as plant stamping itself. And it is a problem, has been a problem, and only enforcement will, will deal with it uh, at some point. You know, we've seen telling stories from years ago, but uh, get a call from a boat official job we've never seen. And a state that worked in for five years. And I said, what are you stamping? So we physically took out the stamp, photocopied it, and put it on the drawing. So I can sing some stories about the guys stamped plans that are pretty amazing. So I mean I don't I don't want to prescribe here for a lot of educated people where that level needs to be. I just think that right now we're scared got to bring it into focus, and uh, just like any code issue, somebody, somebody pick it, let's, uh, let's have the debate and discussion first. Well, I don't think until you define level of competency, whether it's a PE or a nice level three or four, until you're, you're going to get this resolved, because when I looked at insulation review plans, by both that were prepared by another engineer or by a contractor, I've seen both great and terrible nice at level three and four stamp plans, and I've seen great and terrible pre-engineered systems too. So it's you know deciding that the PE is competent or the nice at level three or four is competent is just basically a blanket statement because it's you know what it boils down to is the person that's putting their signature on the plans and whether they were actually competent, or whether they actually looked at the plans or were involved in preparation. Again, rubber stamping, whether it's a nice set rubber stamp or a P rubber stamp. Uh, very accurate point, and I think that the debate can be taken out whether it's a contractor who has a nice set or a P or a It can be taken away from the subject of delivery method, whether it's not design build or plan spec. The bottom, at the end of the day, whoever was responsible for preparing the drawings have to have a some measured level of confidence for all of the uh, flaws that the present system has. There is a system in place that needs enforcement. And uh, if we don't define the rules, you know, somebody has to be brave enough to throw something out and be argued. And uh, but if the group of people in the room agree that something needs to be done, I think you've got to come forward without that. So maybe then one idea is if, if, if the nice set level is something that seems, or the nice set route is something that's popular, we 
group of people can go together, as opposed to sitting back and you know, hoping that if, if, if you're for an ISET and not for um, requiring a PD, that you should go and propose the nice and you get it through it and, and then have that bar be set as opposed to sitting, sitting back and hoping that the PE requirement never materializes. What, how, on what level, how does that get done legally? What processes? Is that through the building codes division? Is that through the state licensing board? How does, how does I guess historically, Jim, do you know how, how the mechanical engineering bar got set? Yeah, the, it was a it was a legis it is a legislative act as I understand it in each state, and uh, the reason why they come back to the PE is because there's there is not to be a level of training by which you understand what's co what's going on behind, for example, the hydraulic unit, and there there are easy buildings and there are difficult buildings. Are, that's why we get into the debate of the master warranty and stamp and the unique stamp, the master electrician. I think we've got to go through the same process. I, I would challenge this group to be one who takes the lead and say, you know, this is a this is a, a group that serves the industry. And here we are talking about what happens when fire codes get set. We've got three young pushing their CP25, we've got other people pushing that everything has to be done with West Panther. Well here we sit with a group of people that are on one side of the fence saying I said certification needs to be the way to go. Other people saying he should be the way to go. Now, are we sitting here having a discussion with the leader of the folks that are not on a different level? So, the, the, uh, the, a noble step going back to the question what can the industry do to help? I think someone to structure the debate on that particular issue only would be doing the industry a great service, making sure that there are representatives from all sides there in order to construct the answer. And there was and a totally different debate over who is responsible for enforcement. I mean, even that take it, it's been taken to the state level, the Attorney General issued an opinion, the was like any good state agency, we formed a committee. And they're, you know, exploring that as well as, you know, because building officials, at least it's been interpreted that we are not mandated to enforce the licensing laws. We obviously can if we choose to, if documents are prepared that are, that are not by a licensed design professional, we can request that they substantiate that they're not required to, but we are not mandated to police for that requirement. And that's something that I know the Board of Architecture, Engineering, and Land Survey, Interior Designs, would like to see those officials do. But that's still, that's, like I said, it's a debate option or a debate discussion right now at the state level. So, um, as far as the varying levels of competency with the fire protection, how about as far as structural? Do you guys see your electrical or mechanical? Do you see varying levels of competency with those type of engineers? A lot of varying levels of competency among the architects, too. You see, you see people that build some of the dumbest buildings in there, and they're all uh, professional architects. So. And I, you know, in our case, if you, uh, you do things inappropriately, uh, uh, you end up getting sued, and the insurance rates go up, and so you, you end up paying a penalty, you know, for not doing things correctly and not doing things the way they're, they're supposed to be done. But uh, that again is a whole different, different, different issue. Day three. Yeah. Do <laughs> you, you think some of the problem could be eliminated? If before you issue footing permits, that the life safety contractors have to be on board and brought up, brought in on the initial design, because some of the you say the pipe is already hung, and you're reviewing the plans. That's a that's an everyday occurrence. And there's the sprinkler contractor in here that hasn't said, or an alarm contractor that hasn't got the call. By the way, you got the job. We're putting carpet to that. There are some requirements uh, in certain jobs that a list of subs have to be published within the next amount of hours because if you get, you get shopped until the last possible to so forth. Uh, you know, I, it may have more to do with the delivery method. I like the idea of if we can get there, which I think requires some clarification of the uh, problem, trying to get them submitted with the original set of findings. Submitted and then wait for the hydraulic jobs to be done. For example, on the design bid build job, here in a school market, we only got maybe down to about six or seven weeks to get a job done. <coughs> and that's most bid left to the job. I would venture to say 
that 98% of the fire sprinkler jobs are designed building and more build design. And that goes for state jobs all the way down to the applicants. And it puts us in a bind. Uh, the, the contract, the new arm contract, is going to be the same way. Why are we brought in up front? Most municipalities, you know, require some knowledge of the, the superstructure of the building before they issue a foundation permit. I mean, you've got to be looking at the occupancy of the exits and that kind of thing to make sure that you're not building a, a dog. But uh, I mean, there's an awful lot that's not known uh, even by us in terms of the systems that are going into the building when we go out and issue a foundation permit, particularly this site time of the year. You know, want to get the dirt work done before it freezes. That's a pretty typical kind of uh, scenario. But some municipalities do say, you know, we're not going to give you a foundation permit until you give us a complete set of plans and mechanical and electrical will have to be there too. So uh, it varies considerably from one place to another. We at the state may be blessed in the fact that for most of the projects I deal with, I do see the fire protection signal drives ahead of time. You know, so I do, now they're not the shop drives, but at least I can review them for smoke detector, greater rise detectors, notification devices, be it one stroke, one of the case may be manual pole stations, fire department access panel, I can at least review that. Now, you know, like many things in, in documents, what the you know construction documents show or what the field or what the shop drawing show may be different, but we review all the documents that are submitted to us. And the inspector, at least in our case, tries to ensure compliance with the approved drawings and it would be when they differ from that that they would probably, you know, I don't think the shop drawings fit alarm systems. I know, I get the it's under the electrical documents that I would so we don't mandate that, at least at the state, we mandate the shop drawings and the fire suppression because there are virtually no other, other, there isn't really any drawing other than that. I mean, we may see the architect identify the building sprinkler. On some larger projects, we may have a drawing that indicates what light hazard, ordinary hazard, these areas of this, these areas of that, some parameters that we absolutely don't get. And like you said, 99% of the, you know, cases, we don't get actual layout or I draw account as part of this little document. We are basically out of time. Is there anything you guys specifically want to take around? Yeah, design build and performance based design. All right. Good. Good. Okay. Make an opening statement. Okay. Uh, those, those two uh, design methods and building methods are driving us in Minneapolis crazy. It's eating our lunch. Uh, we put so much time from the city standpoint, both the building inspections and fire, into helping with the design on, on performance-based design and not getting paid for it. And it doesn't, it's not reflected in the building code or the building permit. Uh, we don't have a separate fee structure that you know, we can charge somebody for the $300 that uh, we, we spend on, on their project where if it was a prescriptive design, we'd be sitting back, waiting for the shop drawings to come in, we review them, and we're done with them. Um, and then John mentioned the uh, building design, that, you know, that's another problem, is uh, where the building's already up, and uh, they're asking for a certificate of occupancy next week, and the shop drawings for the sprinkler and alarm are coming in this week. Um, it, it creates havoc for us. So. Uh, two major issues, and that's one of the things that Minneapolis Fire Department is looking at, is how are we going to be able to charge for that? We're trying to come up with a system of uh, you know, $100 an hour or whatever. If you want to call us up and uh, propose a performance-based design, well, when the clock starts. Are so, you speaking specifically of fire protection or specifically of fire protection and alarm or just in general design building? Um, well, in general, performance-based design and then alternative designs. Um, like I said, they, they take a lot more of our time that's covered by our permits, and that's, that's a huge issue. Thank you.
and take some of our time, because I have architects call me and say, how the hell did Minneapolis approve that? <laughs> and I'll go, well, it's probably a government space, right? One more art gallery, whatever, in the uh, theater. I mean, you know, they'll, they'll see an article in the Sunday paper. I had an architect call me and said, they said the grand room was this by this. Code 101, how did they get exit separation? I'm going, you got me. I said, I'm sure it was a performance-based design, which is acceptable. You know, if you want to talk to the city, I'd recommend talking you know, to Gail or Dan. And, right. and I said, I have no doubt that they didn't ignore it. I said, it was performance-based, and it didn't happen. So. Hey, okay, Gordy, your, your counterparts at Minneapolis and the building department do have some system like that in place. Yes, yes, yes they do. So, so yeah, they, it's the fire department. And we are disproportionately burdened with from the, from the fire. If we get called in, because uh, generally, what are you using, you know, as the base of, basis of performance-based design? You're using sprinklers, you're using fire alarm systems, you're using smoke control, generally. And uh, so that's what we get involved with. Right? So towards your yeah, area. absolutely. So it, it's a huge problem from our standpoint. So that's why I wanted to throw Taxes. <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, Gordy, I'm confused. Uh, when, when you stated that uh, the, the meter is ticking when you're being asked to review a, a performance-based design, what are you being asked to review? I mean, are you are you are you sitting down with a blank sheet of paper and discussing all those alternatives, or are you looking at a performance-based design? along with the architects and engineers that come down and, and explain that to you for, for approval? Well, it generally starts out where you have a meeting with the city departments along with the architect, engineers, uh, their fire protection consultant, and they propose what they want to do. And you say, okay, we would like to do this. It doesn't meet this section of the building code. We're proposing to try something along these lines. And then we sit back and, and take a look at it and say, well, yeah, that might work, but it takes a lot more you know, information to prove it to us, or your proposal be, you know, is out of the question. And then you end up with a series of meetings. As they refine the design, we get, you know, not only meetings, but there are phone calls, there are documents to review additional plans. Uh, then you have cases where, uh, the design itself is questionable, where you actually do mock-ups to make sure that it works. Um, and it just sucks up a lot of our time that we don't have. And that's, we're, we're trying to figure out a way to get compensated. And I think that was an item that's, you know, since the conception of performance-based design has always been laid out there as a big question mark of how the AHJs, how the municipalities actually were going to get compensated <coughs> for this review. And, you're absolutely right. That hasn't been addressed by uh, by anybody. I think another big question is, is whether you have competent people to, to actually review right, and say whether this is the equivalent or not. Yeah, yeah because the Gordy in Minneapolis is, is raising this flag and saying this, you know, what would happen if you did a performance-based design in Fargo? Yeah, or Rich, or, or you know, just pick a, pick a city somewhere. I mean, that, that, is it even a bigger problem than that? So that's an issue. Ken, Gordy, as AHJ, don't you have the right in the code to make the submitter pay for a third party independent uh, reviewer? Yes. And have you guys ever done that? Yes, we have. But yeah. then also, you have the problem of bringing that third party up to speed. What will you accept in your jurisdiction? Uh, so yes, to answer your question, we have done that, but it still takes a lot of our time. Some of the details are taken care of by the third party. But the, and the other thing is what you find is uh, design creep through it. And initially they'll come in and, and the intent is we're going to do this area of performance-based design. As time goes on, well, it gets bigger. Now we're going to apply the same thing over here. Well, it's not the same occupants. There are things like that happening. So, so it's it's very hard to just add a you know a set fee on a permit to cover it because that, you don't know where it's going to end. When it's going to end. 
Well, isn't the point, many I hate to say it, but is the point of performance-based design just money-driven? It's to save the owner money to build the same thing with less money. <laughs> money is being that saved. Really cool. So, yeah, but money is being saved, therefore money should be spent. You know, you have to spend money right. to make money, you have to spend money to save money at this point. So, I mean, how often is a performance-based design presented that's going to cost the building owner more? what they intended rather than less. Well, their argument is, is a lot of times they're paying more up front for engineering costs to, to do the actual design. What we find, though, is at the end of the day, on the building permit, maybe less. You may have less hard construction in that building. Therefore, the building permit itself is less. The city is actually bringing in less funds, spending more time. <coughs> Any other comments, questions? Or did you get to the design bill part of it? What would you want to talk about? Not other than just because the contractors are behind the eight ball, so are we. Uh, we, we get calls from a developer saying, uh, you haven't reviewed the plan that just came in yesterday. Well, why not? Well, we've got a month back on. Why didn't you get the plan in earlier? It was not the contractor. We got the contract two weeks before. You know? So it's, it's issues like that. The other, the other problem with that is we just had a project in Minneapolis where the developer decided not to hire an engineer uh, to lay out or determine what level of protection or do a preliminary design on fire protection, they went out to three sprinkler contractors and said, okay, you guys find out what needs to be done and then give us a bid and then we'll choose the whole bid. Well, over a period of two months, I'm getting calls from three different contractors, sometimes on similar subjects, maybe three weeks apart. So all of a sudden, I become you know, I take on the job of the of the engineer, basically what the engineer should have been doing, uh, because the developer has chosen to save money on their part. Well, they have shifted it over to the city. So they've done. Just to just when you're saying that you're talking about 98 percent of the job is almost done, and it's built design, is that situation where the job has been going on, but. Uh, I just want to make sure I understand the question that you raised with the issue that the generals are going to wait until the last minute to award that, that contract. You know, as to, to throw some uh, positive ideas on it, we work in all 50, all 50 states now, but I have the luxury of going to battle in Chicago, Los Angeles, New York. There, there is room for a couple of things. Number one, to get the plans in earlier by requiring that mm -hmm. the shops be produced by a certain date. And if you're running into situations like that, and even if you speak to the architect or the consulting engineer, that can be made a contractual requirement in the specifications. Uh, just like a lot of federal work says, you've got to list your subs in 48 hours. Uh, it, it, that's one of the main reasons that that was important. Army Air Force Exchange Service did a lot of that some years ago. And some of that has changed with the uh, Changes in delivery methods. Uh, so that, I would offer that as a suggestion that maybe it's a way to get started and help with your cause. And, that, and, and I think subsequently your cause, where you say, Why did I have to get the plans on Tuesday? And you want them back on Wednesday? And they say, Because I just got the job on Monday. And uh, from a, a fee basis perspective, I, I think that there would be a role in terms of the performance based design is done. I think there would be, as long as it's clearly communicated to the design community, there would be room to get a revenue stream out of it. I think the issue would, you know, where, where does base uh, civil service work stop and customized service begin? I think that's a debate that has to be right to be And maybe it is. If you go down the performance based design path, that, that starts to be interesting. I think they're starting to call them user fees instead of taxes now. Right. Any other questions, comments?
because I think one for well, this forty on the on the side of the time that you're spending as a contractor, they're dumping on us and giving us schematic drawings and they'll pay. They expect us to have the answers because we're the experts. They want to hear anything. No complaints. You know, or somebody else. They would think you're incompetent. I mean, I know we we'll lean on you, and but some things need interpretation. And some we don't always have the answers ourselves. So. It comes from the developers, and you used to hear the term fast track construction years ago. You don't hear it anymore because it, it is a uh, constant now project. So we're, we're behind the eight ball on, on most of the projects I have. We have make decisions on the fly, and we work for the pipe, and we're installing systems without, you know, without the permit, and without your inspection. And you know that. We've, right. that. We've taken pictures on projects. And, mail them to you because they're bearing our work. I mean, it's terrible. But it's still a risk is on the contract. Let me let me ask you if if the city of Minneapolis uh, passed a rule or ordinance saying that you cannot start work and step on the job site until you had the permit back in your hand, and we do not give you the permit until we can approve the drawings. Man, I'll tell you. <laughs> what would happen if the AGC would just run all of you? I mean, you, they, they would fight you. I mean, for that's the only source of protection is, is uh, still, in my opinion, is still low on the toilet bowl. Yeah. HVAC, plumbing, heating, people can feel that. That's real stuff. Fire protection is a non moving thing. They could care less about it. And, uh, Tell Stan to do it. That was more of a comment on my part, but the, the question I have is for, I think, more for, well, 99 plus percent of the work we do is design and build, and a lot of it's residential these days. That market's really picking up. And uh, there's a lot of exceptions that are being taken by architects contract and I'll speak for myself, I'm not real familiar with in regards to when you take exceptions to the building code and turn a 13R building into a 13. And when we get a set of plans, a code um, references that you put many times on the, on the title sheet that aren't always there because the plans are preliminary. Um, when I can call a typical architect, is he educated enough to know that the decisions that he made when he designed that residential occupancy, that he took exceptions to the building code, whereas he can answer the question whether that building is 13 or 13 R. I don't think typically they are, enough. unless they do an awful lot of residential construction. Then then they certainly have run into that problem in the past, whether you get a, some sort of credit with the 13 R or with the 13 system. So you know, we, we bumped our heads on that you know, years ago. But so we'll, we'll be putting on the plans what kind of <coughs> system needs to be installed in order to be in conformance with what our agreements are with the building commission. But I don't know that that's you know, so typical. Uh, in Minneapolis, before we'll accept a plan designed to 13R, we have a sheet that basically is a statement that needs to be signed by the architect on that project. That it, <laughs> and it basically says that uh, the architect did not take any exceptions in the building code that would require that system be uh, NFPA 13. And you know, some architects, we get the signature back right away, but a lot of them we get phone calls. And they're asking, well, what do you really need? What kind of exceptions could I have taken? And you start walking them through it. And the light bulb goes on and they say, oh yeah, we increase one story. Or something like that. Really. So it's, yeah, some of them do, and some of them don't have a clue. That's why we require that, that statement signed by the government. Well, the confusing thing also is, you already mentioned it, with the IBC, under the UBC, it was pretty easy. You got no benefits from a 13R. You got nothing. You didn't get storage, you didn't get number, you know, a, a feed, you didn't get anything. Under the IBC, I still have to check. Because you do get stories with 13R. You do get an increase in height. 
You may get a reduction on the corridor. You, I mean, there, and now, of course, they throw in that you can get a reduction or elimination of draft stopping with a 13R if you put heads in the attic. Now, explain that to an architect because, number one, they didn't know you didn't put heads in the attic to begin with. With a 13R, they said, yeah, but you put a 13R and you put heads up there, but they don't tell you how to install They just put heads up there. So, this 13R, and I'm sure my agents even tell you how to space heads in the attic, or just 13 type that. So there was, you know, there's a bunch of little things that, no, and I mean, we just, I told uh, Brooke here, we just, we, the state of Minnesota, with concurrence with the state fire marshals, just issued, issued a joint letter yesterday because there are municipalities out there and engineers and architects who mistakenly have built buildings using a 13R system for allowable area increase. That is not permitted. Absolutely not. However, ICC, who publishes the code, when they first came to Minnesota to tell you what the 2000 IBC said, said you could do it. But then they decided somewhere along the way, no, you can't do it. Then the code is published, and the code is very confusing because it says you get an area increase with, and they don't say 13, they say with the sprinkler system installed in accordance with 903 point blah, 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 point one. Well, you go to 903 point blah, 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 point one, it says 13. But at the end of it, except, it says except as modified in 13R, 13D. So they were going to that saying, okay, I go to this, but then I can go to this because of that. That was never the intent. And 2003 makes it very clear. You do not get an area increase with the 13R system. Now, unfortunately, we've had some buildings built that the building official, for right or wrong, allowed them. And we essentially issued a letter, Tom Jawaka, and uh, with State Fire Marshal Division, Jerry signed it, I didn't, thank God, and uh, essentially said, you know what, these are grandfather. You know, better, better luck next time. You know, you made a mistake, it's a reasonable mistake, because that's what the code says, but we need to not make it again. These will be grandfathered in, they will be considered compliant relative to allowable area. But, you know, there's, there's a bunch of little differences within the code relative to 13, 13R, and do the architects understand it? There is something, but no, by and large, no, no. Fortunately, they think they can't get anything with 13R, so it's kind of good. They don't realize yet that they, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I think we will wrap things up then. Um, first of all, thank you to all of our <laughs> Next meeting will be January, and again, we do not have a meeting in December, so the meeting notice will go out the week of January 10th, I believe. So, hope to see you there. Thank you.